Hello, good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Greetings from Center Congregational Church in downtown Brattleboro. Although we are all scattered about, not only from different churches, joining with us is the congregation uh, from West Brattleboro and from Guilford, uh, West Dover and Dummerston Congregational Church. This is our second to last uh, Brattleboro area summer union worship service. I welcome all of you. I'm so glad that you're joining with us. And I see there are many ties to one another's churches that we are able to strengthen this morning. At Center Church, we are in the midst of a sermon series this is our fifth of six sermons on apostolic martyrs, and we're looking at sacrifices made for the early church um, by the disciples, by the apostles. And we hope that we see uh, each other and ourselves as modern day apostles. Welcome uh, all friends and guests and members of the church at Center, as well as at, at our other United Church of Christ congregations, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. It is a, a beautiful morning where I am in Massachusetts, and I trust it is also where you are. With us uh, leading in worship is the Reverend Dr. Sh uh, Sean. He uh, recently uh, got his um, doctorate in ministry. So congratulations, Sean. Sean will welcome us uh, to worship with the responsive reading in just a moment. Also with us is uh, Audrey. Uh, the minister of the First Congregational Church in West Brattleboro, um, the minister uh, Lisa from the Guilford Congregational Church is with us in spirit as she is uh, having a time of uh, rest and recuperation um, on her ministerial leave. So we pray uh, that she enjoys this um, time of uh rejuvenation for her. And we also wish to welcome the West Dover Church um, and uh, Jeremy Kirk, the pastor there. Um, he also has sent his uh, regrets, but is with us in spirit. I think that is all five of our churches. So friends, welcome. I pray the service is inspirational and that it gives you uh, food for thought and energy um, and faith for the journey forward. Let us worship God together. <laughs> Thank you. 
sing with us and pray with us, feel God's present power. Let us join in our responsive call to worship as printed in your bulletins. As surely as the new day has dawned, God comes to meet us and be known to us. We will sing to God and trust God's steadfast love. Our hearts rejoice in God's saving grace. God gives life to the dead and creates new things from nothing. We believe against all hope that new life <laughs> can be wrought in us. Jesus invited people to fresh starts with the words, follow me. We want to respond with our lives to take the risks of discipleship. God will raise us up and equip us for our life of service. We rejoice in God's promises and devote this hour to prayer and praise. Amen. Amen. Friends, will you be with me in prayer? Holy Jesus, we are here. We stand beside your cross. Like Mary, your mother, and the faithful women, and John, whom you asked Mary to claim. And we wait for your word to us. Claim us. You are also here. Speak to us in your ever speaking voice. Speak again through your Holy Spirit. For us, it is not yet finished. We are here. You are here, Holy Jesus, speak. I hope we have uh, some children or at least some young adults or perhaps some adults who are young at heart joining us for our children's moment this morning. I would like to uh, ask uh, folks out there and feel free to answer uh, at home. What is this super exciting something that I have right here? Wow. Look at that. Look, what is that? It's a can. It's an aluminum tin. How exciting. Look what it does. It just, well, it just sort of sits there, doesn't it? It doesn't really move. Okay, so I admit it. It's not terribly exciting. It's just a tin can. That's all. But 
guess what? This weekend for my daughter's birthday, we took a tin can and we built out of it a robot. Wow, look at this thing. And we put a little motor on it and we put wheels on it and look at its little eyes. And then look what happens if I turn it on. Can everyone see this? Now look, here we go. Whoa, look at that. It's not just a tin can anymore, is it? It's moving all around. Look at that. If and I it'll fall off the table if I don't catch it. Now, I know that's quite a technological marvel. All you need is a battery and a motor and some wheels and some silly googly eyes. And you can turn what was just a silly tin can that does absolutely nothing but sit there on the table into a fantastic toy that moves all around. And I bet you anything, if the battery was big enough like my Tesla, this aluminum can would go all the way to Lisa Tazerial in Austria and chase her on her train. Well, why am I showing you these two different cans? Well, what I would like us all to learn is that we all belong to beautiful churches. But guess what? Those churches don't move, do they? They just sort of sit there. They don't go anywhere. And that's a little bit of a limitation. If we want God's word, if we want the gospel, if we want God's love to go from one end of this earth to the other. So you know what we can do? We can use technology. We can use these computers. We can use the internet so that we can hear Mary's organ music and we can hear a sermon and we can do liturgy together. And it's even more amazing than that. It's not just one church that can gather and worship together, but it's actually five churches that are gathering together. And thus, we are no longer just a stagnant and standing church that can't move anywhere, but rather we are now, by using our computers and technology and new skills, and most importantly, new ways of thinking inspired by the Holy Spirit, we can make our churches, which were otherwise stopped in place, we can have them move all over the world. I'm going to continue to play with my tin can as we hear our holy scriptures this morning. Thank you. Before I begin the readings um, of our scriptures, I'd like to invite you to pause, open yourself to the invitation that we hear through our United Church of Christ denomination, God is still speaking. How can you take the message if the script of the scriptures into your life today? In our reading from Matthew, probably written by the disciple Matthew, we're presented with Jesus deep into his ministry, who meets a tax collector, Matthew, or in two other gospels, his name is Levi. We understand that the biblical time, that in biblical times, tax collectors were often corrupt, not to be trusted, not someone a religious or righteous person would associate with. And yet Jesus does sit with them in their homes. Jesus talks with them on the streets. Meanwhile, we have the Pharisees and a group of people on the other extreme, the disciples of John the Baptist, questioning Jesus's disciples about Jesus's association with those questionable people. Jesus hears them and challenges those 
who question his actions by giving a symbolic response using a relationship between two kinds of people we can relate to then and now, a doctor and a sick person. Jesus challenges us to be among or minister to the sinners, just as doctors are drawn to sick people. Jesus takes this one step further by pointing out that some people don't think they are sick, or in other words, those they are the righteous ones, such as the Pharisees, and are not the ones who were called to be among in our ministry as God's people. In Matthew, we're being challenged to think about who are our current tax collectors? Who do the tax collectors represent to you today? Who in society, who is society telling us to stay away from because they can't be trusted? What if you or your church community sat with those people? How will you behave? How is God still speaking to you about who you should invite into our lives as God's people? And now from Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call, not the righteous, but sinners. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in John, the gospel of John will hear the words, the disciple whom he loved. Like the Gospel of Matthew, many historians believe John was written by John, the disciple of Jesus. The Gospel of John mentions this phrase five times, disciple who he adored. Is John speaking about himself? Why didn't he intentionally name himself? Do we know that John, the disciple, wrote the Gospel according to John? Do we know that John is favored among the other disciples? What does this message mean for us today? How are Jesus's words speaking to you today? And from John 19, 23 through 27. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier, they also took his tunic, now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided many clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home.
something up. I was just seeing if it was the same thing. Guilford, Dummerston, Westover, and West Brattleboro. We are so pleased that you can join us in the midst of Center Church's sort of devotional survey of Jesus' disciples who became apostles of the church. And there we have 12 uh, of the, what most likely was, uh, many more disciples that followed Jesus. At center, we are anticipating the six week relaunching of our church as a hybrid church following which we will have a stewardship campaign that will take us all the way to Advent in December. So we are discerning how as members and as a church, how we can give of ourselves as did the disciples for the greater good. Though we are nearing the conclusion of our journey, you are with us on a Sunday on which the theme is as relevant to your churches as it is to ours. Today's message pertains to us all because we are sort of all in the same ecclesiastical boat, as it were. The continued decline of mainline Christianity in the country and the state, society's increasing secularization, and the ravages of COVID-19 have left clergy and lay people fewer in number, and those remaining are, to carry on the metaphor, terribly seasick. All our churches have in common the recent inability to worship in our sanctuaries, the agony of separation, and the now emergent hope for our gathered reuniting. I pray the lesson from two apostles, Matthew and John, will inspire us all. One of the things that we have learned in this sermon series is that most of the disciples had multiple names. And multiple names make it difficult for scholars to determine exactly how many disciples there really were and who was who. Matthew is another perfect example. In our scripture reading, the author named the tax collector Matthew. However, in the same passage as recorded by Mark and Luke, 
the tax collector is named Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Levi was a tax collector who Jesus walked past while he was seated at the customs house. And Jesus directed Levi to, quote, follow me, unquote. Matthew must have been enamored with Jesus, for he invited Jesus to his home for dinner. On observing this, the scribes and the Pharisees, they accused Jesus of eating with tax collectors and sinners. Well, what's wrong with tax collectors? Well, as Lisa rightly mentioned, at the time, Jews despised tax collectors as they were identified as collaborators and traitors helping an invading imperial force plunder their own people. Matthew was a Jew who was deeply resented by his own. In this series, we have also learned that all but two of the disciples, Judas Iscariot and John, were executed, martyred. One account of the scriptures recall Judas committed suicide by hanging, that's in Matthew, while Luke has him simply falling forward in a field whereby his entire abdomen emptied its contents. No matter which, no one killed Judas for his faith. The other disciple not to die at the hands of those who persecuted the Christian apostles was John. The most plausible theory of John's death states that John was arrested in Ephesus and faced martyrdom when his enemies threw him in a huge basin of boiling oil. However, according to the tradition, John was miraculously delivered from death. The authorities then sentenced John to slave labor in the mines of an island called Patmos. On this island in the southern part of the Aegean Sea, John had a vision of Jesus the Christ and wrote the prophetic book of Revelation. The apostle John was later freed, possibly due to old age, and returned to what is now Turkey. He died as an old man sometime after 98 AD, the only apostle to die peacefully. Matthew's name also being Levi and John being the only disciple other than Judas Iscariot to die of natural causes make for interesting history. But such trivia is not inspiring. I would like to conclude by focusing on that which the two apostles have in common and thus that which inspires us this morning. Church tradition holds that Matthew is the author of the Gospel of Matthew and John is the author of the Gospel of John. Of course, scholars rightfully always dispute tradition. Yet, if Matthew and John wrote the two Gospels by the same names, they are distinguished from Mark and Luke, who were not disciples or apostles. In short, Matthew and John were the only two disciples to author any of the four Gospel narratives we read in our Bibles. Matthew and John were writing apostles. And we learned last week that the word apostle means emissary, or literally in Greek, the one who is sent off. Matthew and John were therefore writers sent. A theme we have been following in this series is how can we at Center, how can all of you at Guilford, Dummerston, 
West Brattleboro and West Dover be emissaries, apostles for our churches, for the United Church of Christ, and for the Christian church as a whole. Well, if we take our cue from the apostles Matthew and John, we will communicate the Christian message in a new and different way. We will tell the story of Jesus the Christ using a different medium than before. We will reach those who are not within our doors using new technology and skills so that like the gospel writers of old, we will transcend time and space again to tell the good news. All of us now gathered are around our screens. Some of us like it more than others. Some of us love this virtual thing. Some of us despise it. And we would rather throw these damn things out the window, and we would rather go to church. Yet we are all here. And we are here because this is the best way we know how to be together, to communicate with one another, to show love to one another, and to hear the story of the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, Jesus the Christ and to celebrate the growth of the Christian church during ordinary time. Friends, I have three heroes. Bob Keller, Marion Daly, and Gisela Robeck. All three are in their 90s. I think except for Marion, she's 80 something. She, she's just a youngster. But these three apostles of our church, despite their age, despite their preference for gathered worship in the sanctuary, and despite financial limitations, acquired new technological devices. Perhaps they have not been mastered, but they learned new skills. They adapted to new circumstances and they became, I don't know, what I call gerontological techies and arguably make more use of modern computer technology than I. Bob, Marion, and Gisela are helping to build the church with their willingness to adapt, to learn, acquire, use, and purchase new equipment and acquire new skills so as to not just strengthen themselves, but strengthen our church. They are modern day Matthews and John's. And this is why. Jesus' ministry concluded in the fourth decade, immediately after which most, if not all, of the stories of Jesus were passed on verbally. Verbal transmission of Jesus' lessons and healings, it worked well within the, the local sphere of Jerusalem. But by about 40, 50, or 60 years after Jesus died, things needed to be written down or they would be forgotten forever, especially after the fall of the temple and the sacking of Jerusalem by Titus and the Romans in 70 AD. So two of the disciples wrote down what they saw and heard. Levi or Matthew, if he did not write the Gospel of Matthew itself, he wrote a document scholars called Q that sourced Matthew and Luke. Q was 
with Mark and some of Paul's letters, the earliest written source of Jesus' ministry. The early church in the first century was in a time of terrific vulnerability. And so are our churches, terribly vulnerable during the COVID-19 pandemic. Matthew and John took advantage of a technology, writing, and with it wrote two gospels that could be duplicated and spread all over the known world. And in the same vein, we in the Wyndham Union Association need to and must be hybrid churches and thus reach people who will not or cannot come through our doors. We need to and we must acquire the skills to communicate our church's ministries via Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, and whatever else comes down the pike. So that like Matthew and John, we are able to bring our faith tradition to what is our Gentile world. We in the Wyndham Union Association can and must use projection and audio technology to better communicate the gospel while gathered in the sanctuary. And I am thankful to be a part of an association of churches that is beginning to learn these lessons and in fact employ them already so that we can even gather here around our screens together and thus make our churches increasingly relevant and vibrant in the future. Thank you, Gisela Robeck, Bob Keller, and Marion Daly for making our churches relevant by being modern day apostles. May we who are younger than you have the courage to emulate you and thus navigate our churches into modernity and the ways of the future, just as the apostles of old did. This was the word of God, and it was preached to all of you at home, the people of God, and the people of God responded, amen. I begin our prayers of the people for the people with a, a, a poem um, written by Lisa Ann Moss de Grenia, um, based on Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. Jesus, we bow in wonder at the expanse of your embrace, the breadth of your inclusion, the surprise of your grace. We seek and seek and seek, including those we write off as beyond hope, as the outcasts, the public sinners, the self-serving, those who collaborate with evil and oppression, why are we surprised? You desire mercy, not sacrifice. You are the great physician coming to those most in need of healing. Forgive us. Forgive us for forgetting who you are. Forgive us for forgetting our own sin and isolation and collaboration. Forgive us for judging. Forgive our self-righteousness. Forgive us for limiting you when we are so desperately in need of you. We are those most in need as well. Create in us clean hearts and renew your Holy Spirit within us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on us all. And we continue in our prayer, O Creator, 
As we lift up so many prayers for your people, Today, we are many people representing multiple congregations, and each congregation lifts up specific members. From Center Church, we lift up John Crutcher, who struggles with lingering effects of COVID-19, and his wife, Beth, as their daughter has, has um, moved on back to New York. We lift up Marion Daly, recently admitted to Pine Heights for arthritic symptoms. And we lift up in our faith community as well as all the other congregations, the long-term, the people who are planning for the continued growth of our congregations. Globally, we lift up the people from war-torn countries, those people in Afghanistan, we especially lift up. We lift up your people who are in areas affected by natural disasters, Haiti from an earthquake, and all areas affected during this hurricane and tornado season. Today, the people of New Orleans and Louisiana, we pray you touch our lives through your message in Matthew and John. And now we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Amen.
My friends, press on to know the eternal one who desires our steadfast love. Christ came not to call the righteous, but sinners to heal the sick, not the satisfied. Aware of your need and eager to find life, answer Christ's call. Follow me. Go in peace. Amen.